Hello and welcome back to Micro Teaching with Mr Newmark. Today we're looking at the second in our sequence of videos on the new 9 to 1 GCSE British Medicine topic. We're looking at the Renaissance today and the question we're trying to answer is this one. How far do you agree with the interpretation that Renaissance was medically insignificant? In order to effectively answer a question like this, you must provide evidence for both interpretations and then sum up in an evaluative conclusion. Let's begin with evidence that disagrees with the interpretation. So we're going to begin with Thomas Sydenham. Thomas Sydenham, also known as the English Hippocrates, was a doctor who lived during the Renaissance and did not believe that you should base all your practice on the work of Galen. He advocated going to the bedside of ill people, watching them carefully, writing down what was wrong with them, and then using common sense methods to try and treat them. Using this method, he was able to be the first to describe scarlet fever, and he was also more likely to advocate eating a good roast chicken and drinking half a bottle of wine to build up your strength than he was to recommend bleeding or purging. Thomas Sydenham, and many educated men at this time, was a member of the Royal Society. This was one of the first scientific organisations, and its purpose was to spread the new scientific discoveries around. And this encouraged people to begin looking at the natural world for answers, rather than expecting everything to be explained by God and superstition. They provided laboratory facilities, they also published books and organised lectures so that members of the public could educate themselves too. Just as important was William Harvey. William Harvey, by dissecting dead bodies and conducting vivisection on live, cold-blooded animals, was able to prove that blood circulated around the body and was not burnt up like a fuel, as Galen had said in his books. This disproved bile humours, and that's incredibly significant because it meant that now people began to look for new ideas as to what was causing disease. In a similar way, Vesalius also challenged Galen. Vesalius, living in Belgium, used to dissect bodies of dead criminals, and he used to write down what he found and get artists to produce beautiful pictures showing his discoveries. He published his findings in a book called The Fabric of Human Body, which exposed Galen as having made 200 mistakes. Even more importantly, Vesalius did not expect people to take his word for his discoveries. He used to encourage people to look and to find out for themselves. And when they realised that Galen had made mistakes, this also encouraged them to challenge the church, because for a long time the church had been saying Galen was perfect, which meant that nobody dared question it. Now people were beginning to question for the first time. All of these discoveries were aided by improved printing. Previously, during the early medieval period, the only way that new ideas could be spread around was by copying them out by hand, and this took ages. Now, printing means that all the new ideas can be spread around Europe very quickly and people can be educated far more quickly than they could before. All of this leads to a sense of growing secularism, which means a separation between religion and science. And this leads people to begin thinking that it's okay to try and find explanations in the natural world and that it was not necessarily going to send you to, he to hell to question the ideas that you were being told by the church. This led to new discoveries later. Now, if you just looked at the evidence we've covered so far, you'd be forgiven for saying you completely disagree with the interpretation because huge numbers of very important discoveries happened during the British Renaissance. But it wouldn't be fair to stop that. We also have to look at the evidence which suggests that we agree with the interpretation, the Renaissance wasn't that important. And that's what we're going to go through now. Let's begin by looking at the training of physicians. Most physicians were still trained using Galen's work at this time and were still prescribing, diagnosing, using those methods. So they were still using star charts, urine charts, and the four humans. Change came, but extremely slowly. Unsurprisingly, Many treatments actually stayed at the same too, and healers and hospitals were largely, well, pretty similar to what they were in the medieval period. The examples of that, we've got apothecaries, barber surgeons, mothers, sisters, and wives are still the people who are treating people when they become ill. And there's not much change in hospitals either. They're still offering prayer and basic comfort, but doing very little to actually treat the sicknesses of people and not seeing it really as their role to try and cure people of their diseases. Predictably, treatments during the Renaissance remained largely the same as they were in the medieval period. We definitely see more continuity than we do change. They're still based on the four humours, which is tough to understand, given that these discoveries have disproved it. 
The reason is simple. It's because there were no alternatives. So although the four humans had been proved wrong, nobody had come up with any better ideas for how to treat people. The new discoveries had led to a better understanding of the human body, but no improvement in treatment. I explained this to my own classes by using my car's engine as an example. If you open the bonnet, I could do a pretty good job of naming what I saw and maybe even describing what it did. But if the car broke down, I wouldn't have a clue how to fix it. And it's the same position that people in the Renaissance find themselves in. So this means that most treatments remain the same, purging, bleeding, and herbal remedies. Although herbal remedies do improve because increasing literacy rates mean that effective ones can now be written down in books like herbals and spread around more quickly so more people know about them. Despite this though, people are still using lots of common, well, lots of uh, uh, folklore ideas. For example, eating a frog if you've got a sore throat. So again, increased continuity. So we've looked at both interpretations. To finish with, we need to produce an evaluative conclusion which shows that we've understood both of these two sets of evidence. Now that's largely down to you. So after this video is over, I encourage you to look at the two interpretations and work out which one you think is more accurate. But I provided one here as a model. I would say that I mainly disagree because despite little change in treatment at the time, the ideas were vital to important later developments. So what I mean by that is that yes, Medical treatment didn't improve much, but if it had not been for these discoveries, well then the later discoveries which did lead to improved health could never have happened. Thank you very much for listening, and as always, more videos to follow.